Talkers, and welcome to another episode of The Hive Mind. My name is John, known as the Orzob Dunn, and this is the show I traverse the multiverse in search of other prominent members of the magic community. And today we have quite a prominent member of the magic community. People in the community know him as a co-host of the Masters of Modern podcast, a host of 10 Minutes of Magic on Anchor. Planes walking in from Los Angeles, California, I have Mr. Ben Bateman. Thank you for joining me, sir. Hey, what's up, man? Thanks for having me on this. I've been wanting to do this for a while. I'm glad we got it set up. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks Thanks for uh, coming on. You brave the L.A. traffic uh, to, to planes walk in. And uh, another thing that you braved was uh, you just currently left Las Vegas, uh, where I currently am, uh, not for too much longer, I might add, but uh, you survived that. So I, I listened to the uh, Masters of Modern podcast about uh, your and Alex's kind of rundown of the event. Uh, man, you, you had to walk a couple miles in a full-on suit in 110. <laughs> yes, it was uh, it was definitely pretty rough. I uh, that one particular night was just just broke me, just ruined me. <laughs> Any kind of cool stories that you wanted to share with the group for uh, for GP Vegas that you didn't already cover on the show? Oh, geez, uh, there's some craps playing. I think we talked about that on the show. Jimmy and Josh, we all lost a lot of money. Uh, <laughs> that was a lot of fun. Uh, I talked a lot about the Commander games that I played. I think on the show as well. That was quite a bit of fun. Uh, I, I guess one thing I probably didn't mention is that I historically don't buy magic cards. Uh, if you like listen to the shows, you guys know this. I like am somebody who is very much just like I'll borrow what I need, my friends, mm -hmm. and I've been that way for a long time. I sold my collection a few years ago to buy a bunch of music equipment. Now I put a small collection back together, but this particular trip I wanted to play a deck, and so I started just like going out and picking up staples, and I didn't buy crazy expensive, but. You know, I, I bought a Horizon Canopy. You know, that's an eye card that's like, you don't really want to just like buy that to buy it. So. Right, yeah. Well, I mean, you could use that in, in Modern and now your newfound love of Commander again, right? Yeah, exactly. I've been working hard at these Commander ideas, just like left and right, trying to build something good. Perfect. Well, as we do each and every week, we like to know your magic origin story, sir. Okay, so my brother taught me how to play Magic in 1995. And I have this one memory of um, my sister is five years older than me. My brother played from like Unlimited, uh, so he had like all those original cards. And I remember he was like giving us a magic lesson before dinner. And like after dinner, I was like, Chloe, my sister, I was like, don't you want the second part of our magic lesson? And she was like, whatever. And she like walked away. <laughs> right. And I went downstairs to the basement where my brother's room was and like continued learning about magic. And I, those early stages of like cards that I owned, I, I remember. I had a red green deck. I think I had a Taiga somehow. I might have stole it out of my brother's binder. Wow. Uh, but I had like a Curd Ape and, and Crawl Worms and stuff, and uh, that was sweet. And yeah, that's kind of like my, my. I loved magic in the beginning, you know, Ice Age. I bought a lot of Ice Age packs. Nice. So that's kind of what the first set that you jumped into was Ice Age? When, right when I started, I remember we went to the local comic book store. Uh, it was called. Coyote Comics, and it was a uh, local, and they had a coffee shop, or it was a coffee shop, whatever, and they had like binders and magic cards, and I got a Kelvin Warlord, I remember, oh, it wow. was like a dollar, it was like a buck probably, right. and that was exciting. Um, Draconian Silix from, uh, from um, Fallen Empires was a card that I thought was really cool looking, because wow. I wanted that. <laughs> That's a card I've heard of in a while. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I think I think it was like fourth edition Fallen Empires was the set that were out when I started. Ice Age came out a little while later. And you stayed. I mean, that that's pretty bad magic. <laughs> I was on and off for a long time, you know. Like I I went in and out of magic for like my whole entire life. It'd yeah. be like two years on, one year off, two years on, one year off, and that's you know. Since when I started working in it, it got a little more like I don't really take time off of magic now. It's not really something that I would think about doing. But yeah, in the years that I just played it. Uh, I was like, yeah, you're like two years on, one year off kind of thing. Absolutely. So how did that kind of transform into the love of modern that you have? Uh, I remember when they announced modern, I had never played extended. I had no interest. Yeah. But I had this friend, John Van Druten, who like went and printed out like proxies of every single good possible modern card. And we were like jamming games at the Denny's. <laughs> and if you know me, then you know how like I like to just try to build jank and... <laughs> I was trying to build like academy researchers with Eldrazi conscription, and I was trying to build like uh, like a Spellwild Oof deck, 
and like all these like just horrible decks. That my earliest version of the deck that eventually would I think become Superior Burning Coco was I was trying to build this deck with Interlyle, Mayor of Aberbrook, Spell Sutter Sprite, um, Moth Dust Changeling. Wow. Because of the, yeah, it was deep. It <laughs> would tie it. together. It would tie together the human type and the wolf type and the fairy type, and I could get all this value out of it. Mm. And I played some swords and like thirst for knowledges. It was a really bad deck, but I worked <laughs> a lot on that in the beginning. Yeah. So total magical Christmas land, trying to make the you know peanut butter go with the jelly. And I mean, did, I mean, you must have won something, right? You kept on the same path. You know, something evolved, all this jank kind of evolved into a somewhat successful deck in your uh, signature cocoa blend, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, Coco didn't exist back then, and a lot of the cards, like Mirror Superior, had just probably had just been printed. And I, I loved that. I thought that card was awesome. I was trying to come up with ways to cheat it and play years ago. But uh, yeah, the Coco deck was <laughs> took a long time of like just like, losing, losing, losing before it was finally turned into something that was like kind of, kind of. So did you have like the dream of like how serious were you like competitively? I know that you uh, and your co-host kind of uh, try to jam as many modern GPs and stuff as possible. Um, did you ever want to go the pro route? Uh, when I was a lot younger, there was definitely a sense that I had that it would be really fun to try to go pro as a magic player. You know, I think um, when you're not around, like I was around competitive magic from like 07 was my earliest competitive magic memory. Mm -hmm. um, I played in pre-releases, but I remember starting to draft at the local store around 07 and understand and playing in regionals and like playing in PTQs. And I still played bad decks because I would build them and they were, you know, shenanigans. Like I played like a Jura of the G2 deck. I think I've told this story before, but like my very first regionals I ever played <laughs> was during Dragonstorm Standard at Times Fire Ravica. And I was like, I'm going to build a sweet deck, but it's not going to be Dragonstorm because it's got to be like my thing. <laughs> so I tried to build a Jura of the G2, Niv Miz, and Aphidianites in Standard. And uh, I wanted to like suspend Niv Miz and Jura. And then like play the control game, and then like flash it, Fiddy and I on the cast trigger, <laughs> like with, with like counter magic protection. And somebody was like, somebody was like, shouldn't you just play Dragonstorm? It plays like seventy percent of the same cards. And I was like, <laughs> and I was like, no. Yeah. And so I, and at very first regionals, it was during when uh, Project X was a deck. So like, do you remember this? It was like the oh. the um, Safi Eric Sutter Crypt Champion deck, and. Do you remember John Laux? He ended up being a pretty solid pro. He was in the great designer search. He worked for Wizards for a long time. He was in the, he was in the first season, right? With uh, uh, Ethan Fleischer and all that? or Yeah, I think so. I think he um, I think he wrote for TCG Player for a while. Yeah. Um, he, back when it was brainburst.com. But he, um, he was playing against in my first match that, and he wrote an article, like a tournament report. And I remember reading his tournament report, and he was like, I sat down against my opponent, and he played like turn one sleight of hand, and I just slumped in my chair because I knew exactly what he was doing. <laughs> and then he's like, <laughs> and he played like turn two, you know, telling time, end of turn, and I knew exactly what he was doing. And then he plays Joyra of the Gitu. <laughs> uh, and I didn't know exactly what the hell he was doing. <laughs> and then he was like, I proceeded to two oh him, and like I was like, ah, but that was like my that was like my famous moment early on. <laughs> well. <laughs> That is a quite an interesting pass, sir. So, how did you get from all that, you know, prominent greatness uh, to joining the the uh, one of the biggest podcasts, you know, for the Magic community, Masters of Modern? So, my buddy Alex Kessler, my co-host, a good friend, and we had met at a at a Magic shop in LA here in like 2011, probably mm -hmm. uh, 2010, maybe like the year the year or two after I moved here. And we weren't really buddies yet. We had like played against each other. We drafted a bunch of Rise of the Eldrazi together. I remember. I teamed events and stuff. And then he did this web series called Top Decking. And it was a series that he created, I don't know if you've seen it, about a girl that works at a card shop and it's kind of supposed to be like this like little sitcom social satire thing. Yeah. And it was like 2011 or 2012 they made the first season and they wrote a character for me called Fatal. <laughs> Greetings, my lady of the dark. Hey, Steve. <laughs> My moniker of the night is Fatal, with a PH. Dude, you have a, you, yeah, you, you have a vamp, vampire. Oh, God! Do you want to know how much ass I've been getting since I started taking this vampire thing seriously? Crazy ass. 
like insane ass. Like Edward Cullen ass. Supposed to be a vampire. <laughs> but I wasn't really a vampire. I was I was named Steve and I pretended to be a vampire to get chicks. Right. And I dressed and I wore eyeshadow and stuff. And so that was really fun and it was like a magic centric thing and Somewhere around the next year, Alex and I went to a GP together in San Diego. We like drove down to one, and we, it was like the first time we'd ever hung out for an extended period of time. We just talked about magic a lot. And then when he started the podcast with Glenn Jones, you know, Glenn got hired six episodes later by Wizards. Yeah. And so Alex was like, because at that point I was like probably six months to a year into my hosting career, and he was like, I have this podcast. It's about magic. It's a modern podcast. Do you want to like? be on it and I was like I mean I like modern but I don't play that much and he was like you've been playing magic your whole life he was like trust me you know all the cards do you want to like and I was like yeah alright and I like played a whole bunch of modern and did an episode and then I was like this is really fun and he was like well yeah you're like you know you're good on the mic which is more important and then I learned a lot about modern and I played a lot of modern and that's like kind of just developed into that podcast I don't know we've done 140 episodes now or something yeah it's a terrific podcast um very, very informative, and like you said, like for, for going from someone that was just kind of a, a super brewer to, you know, kind of having to learn this format and be kind of a voice for the format, I mean, it's, it's transitioned very well, so. Well, yeah, I, th I think that that's why Modern, I've let, my, my skill set as a Magic player has lent itself very well to that podcast, because ultimately, I love the Modern card pool, and Modern is a brewer's paradise. People do brew cool decks all the time. And it's not like brewing a deck with Aether Vial is a crazy thing to do. You know, it's a good card. And like, all that ended up happening was I just started to learn. You so certain cards you just like have to stay away from. Like certain things are just too bad. <laughs> you have to be doing something uniquely powerful if you want to brew. And that, that's what I learned. It's like you can brew as long as what you're brewing is doing something powerful, not just something cute. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I still try to, I'm a little bit of a brewer, a little bit of a safer brewer. Like, I, I go for the Naya Allies and the Eight Racks and stuff like that, where it's not Tier 1, but but the, the decks that piss off the Tier 1 tables, I like to say. Sure, right. <laughs> Naya Allies is a cool deck. Yeah, it, it's actually really good, and it's a, it's a Coco deck. I, I, I got to keep Coco alive as well. Right, yeah, I love, <laughs> I love me some Coco. <laughs> um, so being the only MTG show on the Anchor app, uh, that that's a big deal, and you're kind of representing an entire community that way. Uh, so what was your idea to start on Anchor and starting specifically 10 Minutes of Magic and the very fun, very popular uh, trivia show? Yeah, I think uh, one of my buddies, another host I know named Danny Hoyt, was working on that app. And they, they, they came out last year at uh, South By, and then they were so popular at South By, they won, like, they won Best New App. But they wanted, I think, to get a little more funding and a little more set up, so they pulled off for a year. And about three months ago, um, Roxy, my girlfriend, who does a lot of cannabis content, mm -hmm. she got contacted by Danny about this new app uh, for experts on particular topics. And she was like, yeah, yeah, I'd love to do a cannabis show. You should talk to Ben. He does this magic podcast. And Danny was like, oh, that's a really great idea. So I got on the phone with Danny, and uh, he said, you know, I think we should, it would be really cool for us to have a magic station. What do you think you could do? And I said, I mean, I have a lot of ideas, and trust me, I think I could do a really good job with this. And so, uh, yeah, so Anchor hired me to do this magic station, and it's been pretty interesting to watch, man. It's definitely, um, it's grown very quickly, and it's a really interesting new app. Like, it's a very interesting platform. Um, obviously, some, it, it's, hard, it's hard to break up your segments into two or three minutes at a time, three or four times a day, every single day, and never miss a beat. So I find some like weekend days are a little bit like more aimless, but my Monday through Thursday content is pretty dialed at this point. Yeah. You know, definitely like the news section on Monday, trivia league on Tuesdays, the one card Wednesdays, you know, the throwdown Thursday stuff. It seems to be tracking well and, and it's fun to interact with people on some formats that are not just mock. Yeah. And it's, it's almost kind of like the Twitter of, of that kind of format. I mean, I tend to be a little long winded sometimes. So when I'm trying to jam in, you know, all my information in 60 seconds, it was a little confounding at first, but it's just kind of a learning curve. And I think the more people that get into it, it is a very fun, interactive way to uh, get in touch with more members of the Magic community. And kind of like you said, I, I remember listening to one of them, you said that you kind of want to grow this Trivia League into something. Is, is that still on the docket? or? Yeah, there's some pretty big, exciting stuff coming up. Uh, media projects I'm working on that Alex and I are tied into a little bit. And, um, th yeah, there's a major, major announcement that I've been waiting to make for a while now. 
and uh, the nature of Hollywood is like anything big, anything big takes forever. Sure. So it's very difficult to, you know, I would have thought that I would have announced it already by now, but uh, that doesn't change the fact that when it does announce, that there will be this some trivia component of something very cool we'll be doing. So perfect. All right, and just to jump kind of a little bit back into the cards, like you said on the uh, last podcast about GP Vegas, your return to Commander. So how's the Brea deck working out? Uh, is this something that you're going to keep pursuing? Uh, like, like Alex said, you get to be invited to more you know, uh, <laughs> parties and stuff. You get to hang out because <laughs> you have a Commander decks now. Is this something that you're, you're brewing more decks, or are you just going to kind of keep with the Brea? Uh, I definitely bring more decks. Bray is cool, but Bray does exactly what I don't like doing in competitive magic, which is to be like the, the tier one, yeah. you know, one of one of the best strategies. Um, even though I have to say my Bray deck in particular, I think is pretty unique because it's built as a Highlander roulette deck. Mm -hmm. So like it's playing a lot of like it's playing like Porcelain Legionnaire and like Bomat Courier and like all these like aggressive creatures that are good for one v one. But it has this like mid game engine that I built in that deck that's supposed to take advantage of like Goblin Welder and like all these like sacrifice artifact effects. So Brea really fits into that deck well. That deck's supposed to just be Jeskai, but I had to add black to make sure I could play Brea. Mm -hmm. um, so I am very proud of how that deck functions. It's just that the power level is lower on the whole than I think commander decks necessarily usually have, which is why like I could beat Josh with like like four and five mana burn spells because like nobody plays those in commander. Right. <laughs> um, but I'm definitely working on a Sig River Cutthroat deck. I'm pretty fascinated by the idea of building with Sig. That's totally up my alley. I just there's not that many two mana and less planeswalkers that have two or more colors that are actually very good in my opinion. Sure. And that's what I want to build with. Is I want my commander to be able to come down on turn two. And I want to immediately start doing cool stuff with it. And so if it costs three, it's too slow. I have destroyed many of faces with a Safi Eric's daughter deck. So yeah, I'm yeah. I'm, yeah oh man, that that deck is completely degenerate. So people in the Magic community uh, know you from the podcast and from Anchor, but people in the Magic community might not know you from the other ventures that you do. So why don't we talk a little bit about that? So you're all, you can also find you on like BuzzFeed, Anatomy of an Action Movie, and most currently the Schmodown, which I am a giant fan. I run a little trivia league on yeah. the channel as well. Uh, also a, a musician. So just kind of run down a little bit of the non-Magic Ben Bateman. Oh, uh, well, yeah. Originally, I moved to L.A. to actually play music in 09, but um, I haven't played much music the last few years. I, I definitely used to play a lot. I toured, and I had albums out and everything, and it was a big, big passion of mine. It's what I originally wanted to do. Um, but as far as that other stuff goes, I mean, yeah, I, I always say it's like I should have a station somewhere, a channel or a network or something just called, like, Movies and Magic Cards, because, like, really what it comes down to is, like, that's the two major avenues that I focus so much of my attention on. Sure. Action Movie Anatomy, you mentioned, is a show on the Popcorn Talk Network, and uh, Andrew Guy and I have posted that together for about two years. We've done 105 episodes yeah. now. We're actually taping that in, like, uh, taping that in an hour. We're doing the new trans the, uh, the first Transformers, the 07 one. Ah, the good one. Um, the good <laughs> one, yeah. So it's an hour-long show, uh, one movie per show that we do every single week, and uh, we, you know, just, we have like, a bunch of fun games with it. That show has been a lot of fun to do. Uh, it's been so well. You know, it's it, it. You never know which episodes are going to do well, but it's gotten 11 million total views now on YouTube, which is cool. That's great. Uh, that got us into Schmodown, which Christian Harloff's a friggin' genius. He um, has created a really fun league, and you know, team actions like a really fun thing for us to play out. We've had like a blast doing that, and the fans have had a great reaction. Uh, it's fun because I'm not like a heel in real life. Like I'm a I'm a pretty mellow dude, so yeah. to get to play. <laughs> Yeah, a total total dick and just go all <laughs> just all in on it is really fun. Yeah, Are we playing against? I don't know. Do you actually think I prepare for this sort of thing? We come in, we win as long as the matches are not rigged. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're gonna do one, two, and three. I'm not gonna mess around. Let's just true? win the match. Okay? And your yeah! winner, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, yeah! Ben Drew T. Yeah! You know, it's uh, fun. I mean, I'll be completely honest with you. Uh, like, the first Schmodown that I watched you guys on, I'm like, wait a minute, isn't that freaking Ben from Modern? Man? Like, what the <laughs> hell is going on? Like, I was like, I thought I was in the damn Twilight Zone, but then I put two and two together, I'm like, man, he, he's calling everyone nerds and geeks. I'm like, this jerk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was pretty great on, uh, on Inside Schmodown, or uh, Schmodown Rundown, I was yeah. listening to it, and uh, they were talking about Andrew and I, 
And like, because of the way we present ourselves in that league, if you don't know us, you just think that we're like the biggest douchebag frat boys. <laughs> and the guys were like, the guys were like, oh my God. And the final question in their match, who sold the, and what do they sell in the movie role models? It was like made for them. They probably see that movie like 15 times each. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> right. It's just like, oh, like, are you kidding man? Like I always say magic, the gathering podcast. Like yeah. I, I feel like I'm a pretty credible nerd, but. Yeah, I would say so, but yeah, I can't. And spoiler alert! Congratulations on the on the uh, last big victory. So let's hope that puts you guys into the title contention talk. You know, I think that, yeah, we're hoping that we're going to be in the tournament. It looks looks promising based on the rankings right now. So uh, we you know we're gonna, we're coming for that belt. All right, sir. Right. So moving along, we actually do a game each and every show on the Hive Mind. Today's a little bit different. I've been waiting <laughs> for Ben to be on for this particular thing. So. I mean, you could go back to episode three of The Hive Mind, I think, and I am a big pusher of the Magic the Gathering movie. I want this thing to happen. Oh, yeah. I think oh, yeah. the more people that talk about it, you know, it'll be like a Deadpool effect, right? Like, we got to make right. it viral. So, and I also listened to your guys' uh, cast when you had uh, Roxy on, uh, and you guys were talking about casting the movie. So I want to have yeah, right. a, a little bit of a comment, maybe Twitter battle. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to cast it say who the director is, and we're going to see who agrees with who a little bit more. Okay. All right. So uh, I know you haven't thought about this in a while because that was a couple episodes back, but yeah, yeah. I'm going to put you on the spot here, I, and I have some backups here, so let's go. I think it has to be the Gatewatch, right? Even though that Watsy is, has uh, recently stated that they're going to try to shy away from the Gatewatch a little bit with the coming story because everyone's kind of force-fed it too much, but the movie has to be about them, right? I mean, it, that's, that's Mickey Mouse. Uh, I think yes and no. You know, I think that there's a lot of different. I think there's a lot of different approaches that you can take towards this magic movie. And I think one of the things we talked about on the show was that it's quite possible that it would work better as a as a Netflix series. But I do think that there's a wholesome kind of Justice League feel to the Gatewatch that I'm not actually sure is the is the correct approach. I think like right. a couple of those characters are great, but I do think that. Um, I think you might get a little more mileage out of having a smaller cast of main characters and then some of the other sort of more fringe, weirder characters. And maybe the Gatewatch forms and comes together and that's a later movie. But for that first movie, I think you'd want a director kind of like somewhere in the range of like a Matt Reeves, like a Donna Plain of the Apes kind of guy. Yeah. Um, something a little darker, but also that is like capable of, of sort of making fun of the this is a trading card game aspect of the universe. I think that's how you sort of have to do it. Yeah, absolutely, and, and I think it absolutely would go better with a, a Daredevil, you know, Marvel's Daredevil or something like that, to just give it a little bit of room to breathe. You, you're, we're around the same age, I'm a bit older, but I mean, you probably remember the, the Weatherlight Saga. If I could see a Weatherlight oh, yeah. Saga, that would be, like, the, the best. Like, that would be a lot more entertaining than the Gatewatch, in my opinion. I totally agree, yeah. I mean, if, I would love to see, you know, Gerard and Crobax and Hannah and, and all these... All these characters, like I, Karn, I like I am a big, big fan of like that whole, that whole entire the rat cycle. Um, I love that stuff. I love that stuff. I, I have always loved Gerard. I always thought he was awesome, and um, I'm actually very excited. We're going back to Dominaria next year. Oh my God! Right? Okay, yeah. so sir, let's go for it. So Gideon, who do you got? Oh geez, I have to pull these things out in front of me, but I think in the end, I was I was pretty good with like I think Hugh Jackman as Gideon feels like a pretty strong casting choice. Okay. Um, I, I feel like I had someone else that was pretty sweet. Uh, maybe like you could go Tom Hardy, but I, I think I love Jackman. I'll, yeah, I'll take I'll take the two. So you're going Jackman and Hardy. Yeah. And I'm gonna go. Uh, even though I, I don't really love him as an actor, uh, you know, he's not a fan of the show or anything. I don't got to worry about. No. <laughs> but Channing Tatum, I think, would be oh, yeah. a pretty decent Gideon, and Army Hammer, I think, could probably pull it off. Oh yeah, I get that. Yeah, Army Hammer would be good. It's got that nice regal face. Yeah, indeed. Uh, let's go to Liliana. Yeah, now I seem to I seem to remember Alexander Diodario was like a big name that I, I liked for this one. Um, she would, I think, be pretty solid. I also think you could probably get away with Emily Blunt for uh, for Liliana if you put the right makeup on her. Yeah, I think. Oh, and Kate, and Kate Beckinsale. Actually, it's probably Kate uh, Beckinsale was my final choice. Beckinsale is a good one. I was thinking Eva Green because she's a little bit older. Yeah. Really, really weird. Uh, and then Sophia Batella. I mean, the mummy was crap, but I mean, I could see yeah. her as a Lillian. She even had like the kind of the tattoos and stuff. Right. Yeah. Kind of made sense. Cool.
Uh, uh, let's go to Nisa. Oh yeah, Nisa. Who do I think could play Nisa? I feel like with Nisa, I liked uh, Naomi Harris was a good choice for her. I think you could uh, ethnically you could jump around on this one pretty easily. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I do think that was the one that I landed on that I liked the most. There's somebody else that I'm forgetting who I thought was like a pretty awesome choice, but not uh, not immediately offhand coming to me. Yeah, Zoe Saldana I had, and maybe a little bit oh, yeah. more Rooney Mara. Yeah, Rooney Mara would be good. Yeah, yeah, definitely. definitely. She's, she's definitely reserved enough. Uh, Chandra? Yeah, Chandra, I actually like the idea of Kate Mara as Chandra. I think ah, she'd be a really strong Chandra. That's one of mine. Yeah, I think she'd be excellent. And um, I did think I had like another one that I liked. I know uh, Alex had, had tried to go with Madeline Pesch from Riverdale, but I think she's a little too young. Um, but I do love Maddie Pesch. Yeah. Uh, what about Haley Steinfeld from Edge of 17? Yeah, I love if, that movie. If you, if you go a little bit younger, Chandra, right? I, I think Haley Steinfeld, she's got the right amount of sass. Maybe not yeah. the right amount of like sexy, but the right amount of sass for the role. Yeah, did you see she Edge of Seventeen? Yeah, yeah, she was the main character uh, in Edge of Seventeen. Yeah, I love that movie. Oh man, very underrated. Movie. Uh, Jace, so so Mickey Mouse. Um, yeah, this is the hardest one for sure. He's such an important. I think. Uh, uh, oh yeah, yeah, Dane DeHaan, I think would be a strong Jace. Yeah, he's, yeah, that's one of mine. <laughs> yeah, I think he'd be a pretty strong Jace. I think, um, oh yeah, I had all these ideas for Jace. Uh, oh man, they're all escaping me now. But yeah, I liked, I remember I liked Dane DeHaan a lot. I also, you know, Cillian Murphy is not a bad choice. He could probably hold off. Damn, that's a good uh, one. That's a good one. Uh, yeah. yeah. Dane DeHaan, for sure, it wasn't his fault that Spider-Mans were bad. Um, yeah. He looks just like him. I like Charlie Heaton from, uh, I'm wearing a Stranger Things t-shirt. Uh, yeah. Played Jonathan Byer from Stranger Things. I think he's kind of yeah. in the same boat as a uh, as a Dane DeHaan. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I get that. All right. And a Johnny. Now this is these are bonuses. The last two are bonuses. So a Johnny's voice. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, a Johnny's voice. I think um, Liam Neeson was one that I liked a lot, and um, I also think that. Oh, yeah, that's a tough one. I, uh, Liam Neeson, Idris Elba is a good one. Oh, man, that's a great one. Uh, yeah, Idris Elba might be my favorite choice for that. They can even mocap him. I mean, he's so versatile. I can't yeah, wait yeah, to yeah, see definitely. him as the gunslinger, man. That is my Star Wars, and I cannot wait to see that damn movie. Dark Tower? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, what did I say? Yeah, Dark Tower is what I meant. I got to tell you, I'm, uh, <sighs> don't, yeah, don't, 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 don't hold your breath. Oh, no! No! Don't do this to me, man. Are you kidding me? Yeah, it's right here. I haven't seen it yet. I just hear that. That was like that book. That book series, like hearing the Beatles for the first time. <laughs> yeah, people love it. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. People love it. Damn it. Now I'm gonna go cry in a corner. But before that, yeah, I said uh, Liam Neeson, Brian Cranston uh, for for a Johnny. But yeah. but I do love uh, Idris Elba. You know, especially because he could do it all. Uh, and then last one, uh, you know, in honor of Hour of Devastation coming out, Nicol Bolas. Right. Who would do the Who would do the voice of Nicol Bolas? I mean, I have to say, I was so impressed with Benedict Cumberbatch as the voice of Smaug in the Hobbit series. Sure. I thought he was like pretty, un- pretty unbelievable. Um, and yeah, who else would I think be? Oh, Russell Crowe would probably be a pretty darn good voice. Wow. Yeah. I think he'd be a pretty evil, pretty evil voice. I was impressed with his like sort of monsterishness in uh, in the Mummy. Sure. Yeah. The, the I have the Batch. Uh, that's kind of an easy one. And then uh, another person that you probably met hanging around the Schmodown is Sam Witwer. Yeah. I think that would yeah. be an interesting choice. He he's very versatile on the mic. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, Whitworth. He's uh, he's one of those the Force Bros matches, right? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So, sir, that is the rundown. I'm going to post this, our, our kind of conflicting list, even though a lot of it was uh, was very similar on the social medias. You guys comment and uh, kind of agree with Ben or agree with myself and who you guys want to see in this magic movie. So let's get this thing made, guys. Ben, any kind of upcoming projects that you want to spoil real quick for the group? 
Oh, geez. Um, I mean, yeah, I, you want to watch the Schmodown? You mentioned that. I'm a big fan of that one. I just started doing the Preacher After Show on After Buzz TV. That's, uh, that's every single Monday night we're doing that one. I'm loving that. Um, there's going to be some more magic content. I can't tell you what this big announcement is, sure. but that's going to be a huge one. And um, I'll be on uh, DirecTV Audience Network covering the ESPYs this year. If anybody likes, uh, if they like sports, I don't know. Uh, I do. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, but I guess... And probably other stuff that I'm forgetting, but uh, that's you know that's the main stuff on the, on the pipeline right now. Seahawks fan? Yeah, huge Seahawks fan. Huge Seahawks. Well, you, you got my team now. The Chargers are up in LA, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Be, we're almost in a new era of the Chargers. So. Yeah. Well, I, I might be uh, locating to the uh, Great Pacific Northwest, so I might be a Seahawks fan as well very soon. So, uh, Ben, where can everyone find you? I know it's like a million platforms, but where, where can the good kids find you? Uh, yeah, you guys can find me at Ben Baker Media on Twitter or Instagram, and um, you know, depending on what you want to follow along with, you'll you'll probably find my interest there. If you like magic, you know, go check out the Anchor app. Uh, it's free, Anchor.fm. It's really easy to use. My station is called Ten Minutes of Magic, and I do uh, you know daily content every single day, ten minutes of it. And you can call in instead of tweeting at me. You just like hold down the call in button. I hear your call in. So it's it's like Twitter meets podcasting. It's really a lot of fun. Absolutely. You're a very busy man. Thank you for carving out a little bit of time for the hive mind. Thank you so much for being there. You can find me, John Dunning, at Orzob Dunn on Twitter. They said we said on Facebook and Instagram. Thank you so much again, Ben Bateman, for joining us on the hive mind. Of course, man. Thank you so much for having me. And I will see you guys in the multiverse.